Hi, I'm Tim, he's Brian, welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. From the vault today, the team with the theme is discussing swimmable watches, 100 meters rated or more. Brian, what are you wearing today? So today I'm wearing a 5980 1A, so 120 meter water resistance, Patek Philippe chronograph, stainless steel, uh, Nautilus. So this is the discontinued Patek Philippe chronograph with the blue dial. One of my favorite watches, a watch that is you know, obviously well worn and well loved. You know, one of the key defining characteristics of this watch is that the chronograph hand can perpetually run and that it does not damage the movement. This is fun. Uh, he's absolutely correct. Now, if you note, the 5980 does not have a constant seconds hand. Because of the vertical clutch, you can leave the chronograph running. And while the watch doesn't have hacking seconds, you can actually cheat time in a manner of speaking. Set the watch, synchronize, and then use the flyback of the chronograph to effectively hack and zero the seconds hand. There's a mono counter at the base, which I happen to love, and it has that lovely gradient fade from silver to blue that was introduced on the 2006 Nautilus collection. An awesome piece, and again, like Brian said, 120 meters water resistant firmly in our wheelhouse today. Let me show you a watch that I'm sure nevertheless you recognize. I don't mix it up too much, but the Zin Easy M1.1 is the all-purpose companion. This watch, 200 meters water resistant, 43 millimeters tegmented steel, central register, 500 piece limited edition from 2017, and of course, yes, it is a lefty chrono. This is a fun piece. It's a piece that I have worn exclusively since 2018. It's well worn, and I've never even I've never even aired out the accessory rubber strap, but I'm thinking of getting the full bracelet for it. It is a Tegman bracelet. Okay, Brian, first up, what have you got for me? So, all three watches, I was really lucky that they all fit me remarkably well, and they're all dive watches, or watches that I would bring in the water, and that uh, satisfy your test of 100 meter water resistance and up. So the first watch is gonna be the Panerai 959, 42 millimeter submersible, blue ceramic bezel, granular gray dial. For me, just a beautiful combination coming from Panerai. I was always hesitant to, to wear the submersibles because at the 44 millimeter size, it was just too big for my wrist and it was clunky and I just couldn't see it as something that I personally could wear in the water. You know, when they, and they've had the 42 millimeter submersible for the while, for a while, but they recently uh, launched them with the ceramic bezels. And for me, you know, it was a, a turning point, at least for this size. I'm a big fan of the color scheme. I'm a big fan of the watch. It's a really good dive watch if you're looking for something, I think, you know, a little bit different. And you also have the changeability of the strap. So it comes on the blue rubber, but you could you could put a, you know, a leather panerai strap on this. You could, you know, there's a million different materials that you could do. What I love about this watch is that it's effectively the baby version of the Guillaume Nari chronograph from 2019. Now in 2017, we got the first 42 millimeter submersibles ever, and it quickly became one of the most popular in the collection. That original 682 gave birth to this 959, a number that lives in automotive lore for obvious reasons, but probably deserves higher stature in the world of watches. Of course, we have an element originally introduced on the 389, the ceramic insert on top of the diving bezel, and an unusual deeply rusticated granular almost pebbly like gray dial with the cyan accent of the seconds hand. Now the watch has the famed Panerai locking lever here 300 meters water resistant and it's a brilliant system for those who might be new to the Panerai brand and we have to accept that there are some newcomers out there. It's a full guard for the crown better than a shouldered crown guard and the lock and the unlock action happens as easily as this even with my nails trimmed down for videos I can quickly use the leverage and the cam system to lock the crown. Now let's hear the bezel action, because I've long thought that Panerai submersible bezel action is best in the business for feel and for sound. We should also talk about the thinness of the case. It is very thin. Uh, one of the advantages of the three-day automatic caliber, which I believe is Panerai OP34, it's a Valfleurier caliber, it allows this watch to be firmly under 14 millimeters thick, which is outstanding for a Panerai submersible. And if you take a quick look at the case back, you can see Panerai strap swappers. This one has the quick release system that allows you to slide the bar in and out just by pressing the spring-loaded dimple on the bottom. Add that to tons of loom, and you've got a watch launched in 2019 that is very much a Panerai for our time. A little bit more discretion and comfort with the sizing. It's, it's suitable for more wrists, but at the same time, I can cover up that dial. You know exactly who made that watch. 
The iconic design remains intact. And in case you're wondering, yes, this is the Luminor 1950 case. A lot to love there. Good, good pick. I just picked this up. It is crazy. Mm -hmm. That's my watch, though, so I get to show that one. <laughs> All right. We'll both comment on this watch. We'll share the spotlight. But the star is the Zinn Damazaner. This is the model 1800. The first Zinn Damascus Steel limited edition was 100 pieces in hard black tegament steel for 2015. But for 2018, Zinn launched another 100 pieces in a much more fully realized and recognizably Damascus pattern steel case. So this is the 1800. It is 43 millimeters in diameter by remarkably only 10.5 millimeters thick. Despite that, it manages to be both automatic and 100 meters water resistant. What sets this watch apart from the first Damazaner is first that it's not hard black coated. It has that incredibly hard surface coating. Carburized steel, 1,200 Vickers externally, just like ceramic. It's almost impossible to scratch. But in the absence of the hard black, you can really see the patterns of the folded steel on this dial. You can also see it on the case flanks. And let me let you in on a little bit of a secret. This watch is a monoblock. I don't just mean the case. I mean the case, the bezel, and the dial. They are all one piece. That is why the patterns, the granular patterns, flow from the lugs to the case to the bezel across the dial uninterrupted. It is all one piece made by a local Frankfurt steel specialist that works with Damascus Steel. I believe it's called Baubach Damast. It is in Frankfurt and it is Zinn's partner for this type of material. But another aspect of this watch that surpasses the original, if you look very closely, even the crown is folded Damascus steel. Keep going, you realize even the pin and the buckle are folded Damascus steel, all of it tegament and an extraordinary timepiece that's also beautifully loomed and a full service sports watch, albeit not necessarily on this leather strap. Brian, what are your thoughts on this? So, First off, I mean, you know, it reminds me of a samurai sword, which it does. I just uh, think is, is so cool. And, you know, not, when you see the level of detail associated with even going as far as doing the buckle, you know, you know that the entire watch is thought out from beginning to end. And one of the defining characteristics of the watch, or two, which I think are very subtle that I'm a big fan of, is the black date window, and as well as the luminescent branding of the Zinn brand. Yeah, this watch absolutely pops. It's a rare, highly water-resistant sports watch that's also, I'm going to say by the standards of sports watches, ultra-thin. They don't come much thinner than 10.5 millimeters. This manages to be both a Zinn sports watch and probably Zinn's best take on the dress watch genre ever. Nice piece. Okay. I'm and a it's amazing when a brand like this does such small micro-editions because, you know, it's, it's time-intensive, it's capital-intensive, and it, it's... You know, when you have a, a smaller niche brand that's doing, you know, 50, 100 piece editions, like, it takes a lot and it's so cool that they do so many. Exactly. 200 pieces spread out from 2015 to 2018 is hardly running the mills. This is a genuinely limited edition mm -hmm. and a very special one from one of the great companies in sports watch technology. So, okay. Okay. Let's Power go eye out of the way. Let's go with the Bell & Ross. So, Ross. You know, we don't bring too many on the show, but I brought them in the past and I'm a big Bell & Ross fan. I think that they do a lot of things remarkably well that they don't get enough credit for. So they, when they came out with, with the, you know, the BR03 series, they were the square watch and it was like, you know, off to the races in terms of popularity. So they've made a lot of updates over the years. This is the diver version, 42 millimeter in size. So they make a 42 and a 44 version. For me, the 42 versions have always fit the best. So black ceramic case, they used to be DLC coated, but they would scratch white. So they transitioned into ceramic for that not to happen. You've got a highly luminescent watch, black rubber strap. They're known for coming with other straps, whether it's a, you know, generally it's probably gonna be like an orange or Velcro nylon strap is, is one of the cool straps that they come with in addition. And for me, they've always presented a lot of value, their fashion forward, and I just think it's a overall nice, unique watch. And one of the other features that we talk about a lot on the show is brand recognizability from a distance. And, you know, there's very few brands that from 10, 15 feet away, you can look and say, I know exactly what that is, but Bell & Ross happens to be one of those brands. Absolutely. This basic instrument aesthetic was originally coined back in 2005 with the BR01 at 46 millimeters. 
in 2007, we got the BR03 that you see right here, which is a 42 millimeter case that is far more wearable. Just as Brian notes, the size is excellent. The design is iconic. You know what it is from across the room. I would even go so far as to say this is still an instrument style dial, but whereas the original instrument watch was inspired by analog flight decks of 20th century aircraft, I feel like this could be an instrument on the command deck of a World War II Baleo class diesel electric submarine. This is very marine in its aesthetic. It's big, it's burly, it's no nonsense, it's super legible. It manages to be the rare all black watch that doesn't feel like a novelty. Part of the reason for that is that it is quite thin. With an ETA 2892 base, it manages to be slim in profile. And I should also mention that right up there with Doxa and Panerai submersibles, the bezels on these Bell and Ross divers are among the best. And again, don't take my word for it, let's hear. They have that chunkiness, that mechanical feel. Uh, they have a very- Are the brands using different systems within their bezels? Like, I mean, is, is Panerai inherently a different system in the bezel than the Bell & Ross? The system is always typically some sort of a ratcheting click spring, but the feel and the sound, I mean, it's as different as the exhaust of a Honda S2000 and a Shelby GT350 or a Mustang. Like, you really do get a very different feel depending on brand character. Yeah, I know Doxa, exactly what those sound like. Panerai. Well, we have this worldly automotive audience of many passions. We have wine connoisseurs, automotive enthusiasts, and our watch guys. But the, the cool thing is, uh, this is just the best possible ceramic you can get. Aside from the way it feels and the way it sounds, GNF Chatelain, which is a case and clasp supplier that also works with Richard Mille and MBNF, it's one of the Chanel Group companies, along with Bell & Ross, Romain Gautier, and F.P. Journe. And the ceramic that they make is on par with that from Swatch Group as the most resilient and generally durable in the industry. Not all ceramic is created equal. Chatelain ceramic is not only as scratch resistant as you expect ceramic to be, but it tends to be a little bit better made, better detailed, and ultimately more durable. Not shock absorbing, but more shock tolerant than your typical ceramic watch. Talk about an underrated, like you don't even, because again, you don't even think about those four brands as being part of a group, because they truly operate and are independent effectively. But what a cool combination of four brands between Chanel, Bell & Ross, Gautier, and F.P. Journe. <laughs> it actually is really I mean, cool. A, it's like an awesome, that's an awesome four. And then you started, you've, you've started seeing, and I, I think that you've done some reviews on them, their uh, Chanel jump hours yes. with the Gautier movements. Yeah, the, the Monsieur de Chanel. Officially, Chanel will admit that with the Monsieur, Romain Gautier designs and makes the wheels. I spoke to the people at Romain Gautier at SIHH and their response was, really, just the wheels? Is that what they said? I'm not gonna name names, but you're getting a great watch when you buy the Monsieur de Chanel. I'll also mention that one of the cool things about Bell & Ross is frankly, they don't have, they're not wedded to any idea. They're a mm -hmm. Parisian design house, they are a French company, they manufacture in Switzerland, but you're getting a very, uh, I, I would say, French design sensibility with these watches. They're always gonna be about the iconic shape and details. Uh, just as much as Panerai's roots are Italian, even more tangibly, Bell & Ross's roots are French. Cool. All right. Uh, okay, I'm gonna save my big piece for the end. I'm gonna go with a watch that is likewise ceramic, mm -hmm. but we needed to have one wearable watch among my three. We've had two big pieces. The Zen is wearable, but at 41 millimeters, the Zenith DeFi Classic Black Ceramic is even more so. This is a watch that represents the resurrection of the traditional elite caliber. It has, of course, a bi-directional quick set, a 50-hour power reserve, four hertz beat rated as the hacking second system that you don't get in a standard El Primero. All of this, in a nearly scratch-proof and feather-light black ceramic case that wears really well on a small wrist. If you've got that wrist that's under 14 centimeters circumference, you know that a watch has to both feel light and be compact from lug to lug, and this watch is both of those things. And I can tell you that in spite of the open dial, and it is a rather extravagant open dial with fantastic depth, it's still easy to read the time on this watch, which is not universal on these open work style dials from the LVMH companies, Hublot, Tag, and Zenith. Flip it all over, the watch is 100 meters water resistant, so you're absolutely going swimming. You can see a cool nickel anthracite coating has been applied to the entirety of the movement, giving it a modern look that matches perfectly the general aesthetic of the DeFi case and the open dial. Real fun piece. And full deployment clasp, no expense spared. Brian, what do you think about this watch? 
So, I mean, I've been saying for a long time that I think Zenith is doing all of the right things. You know, they're making very wearable, inherently complicated watches at a good value. So, there's a couple different iterations of this watch. Um, the Defy Lab that came out for me, we, we were lucky enough to get one, is absolutely awesome. You know, executed really nicely. All black watches can be very hard to execute because sometimes it's either too all black, it's, it's hard to read. And for me, this, you know, the fact that the dial is skeletonized breaks up that coloring and actually makes the watch incredibly legible. So the strap is very comfortable. It's a soft rubber. Um, you know, I'm, you know, for me, there's certain rubber straps I don't like. There's certain ones that I think, you know, are very nicely done. This happens to be one of the better ones that's done just because it's soft and supple, almost like a leather strap. You know, the ceramic case is really nice. You know, again, just an overall really well executed watch from Zenith. And there's a lot of questions about where this case design came from. Some folks say, oh, integration of bracelet, strap, and case, that's just a thing of our time. They're, they're following a trend. Or they'll say, oh, I've seen that case in Open Dial before. Let me see this thing. That's Ublo or that's Tag Heuer. But the fact is, in both instances, these are Zenith's own designs dating back to the 70s. If you type in on Google, vintage Zenith DeFi, take a look at what comes up from the 70s. Integrated bracelets, integrated case lug combinations, you're going to see this exact case shape. All of this was native to Zenith long before it was part of LVMH, much less a sister company to Tag and Ublo. So there's a lot of originality there. And for under $6,000, that's an excellent value. Uh, in case you're wondering about some of these prices, for the Zen, just under $7,000. For the DeFi, we're talking just under $6,000. And the watch that I'm going to show you last is just under fifty. dollars But that's the big piece. That is our crescendo. Brian, so, I mean, the size of this is, is spot on for me. You know, again, them not going overly large was a really good move. Having that high polished angle here on the ceramic that just breaks up the mat is a really good detail. And, you know, again, a great watch, really good value, manufacturer movement. You know, to me, again, Zenith is a brand that deserves a lot more recognition for the watches that it produces than it does. That's a fact, and the, the elite movement always lives in the shadow of yeah. the old Primero. Technically, in many regards, it's a better caliber and a much more modern one. Okay, so my last watch is probably my favorite Bremont that's, that's, that's been made. So we have the 40 millimeter stainless steel Supermarine. You know, 40 millimeters is not a size that Bremont does very often. You know, they're traditionally making 43 millimeter watches. And for me, they've, just, they've always been too big and a little bit too thick. At 40 millimeters, this watch fits me perfectly. I've always been a fan of Fotina, which this has. It's almost got like this matte grayish black dial and bezel and it's ceramic. And I just think that the color combination is spot on. You know, it's, you've got the breakup of the steel case there. You've got a calfskin leather strap. As far as bringing this watch in the water, obviously you're not going to want to bring it in with a calfskin strap. They do make other options. Even as far as the details go, you'll see that that Fotina coloring stretches as far as the stitching on the strap in order to bring it all together. So again, just a really well executed watch from Bremont. It's assembled in London, which is really cool and really, you know, obviously really rare. There's not that many brands that are made in London. Maybe, you know, I guess, well, Roger Smith is not technically in London. No, I mean, there's a couple of British made. watchmakers, yeah. but the only one that's working in serious volume in the luxury class is going to be Bremont. Right. Uh, so unless you're going to buy a watch priced well into five or even six figures, I think the most interesting way to get into British watchmaking, granted there are some more affordable brands now, but I think Bremont has the best balanced line across the board. Do you want a diver? Do you want a pilot's watch? Do you want a chronograph? Do you want a dual time? Do you want something that's a weird and exotic limited edition? Or do you want a vintage evocative model? They've probably got the best range in British watchmaking. So this came out in 2017. You can see it's a clear reference to the big crown no guard era of Tudor and Rolex subs, and that's really what they're channel channeling here. Their most common case size is 43 millimeters. This being a 40, exactly like Brian said, it's a much more wearable watch. The other thing they do is they separate out the canister that holds the dial and the movement from the form of the lugs. So this sharp and tight cropped teardrop form means that the watch wears even smaller on the wrist than its nominal 40 millimeters. If 
you wear a sub, rest assured, it's going to look and feel more like a 42. You wear this, and it feels more like a 38. Now, if you look at the case itself, you can see that the side is DLC coated, and that's just one level of their scratch-resistant application. That is super hard, over 1,800 Vickers, but the steel itself at Bremont is surface hardened. So if you're familiar with Seiko Dia Shield, it's a lot like that. And this is something that's standard on every one of their steel watches. So you get that level of scratch resistance baked into the watch. It is a chronometer. It does use the equivalent of an ETA a 2824 automatic. So it stops. How much harder seconds. is it, though, than like a standard steel watch? Well, I've heard that the steel's been tested. One guy bought a watch, and he actually had it drop tested by a physical impact. And where a standard 316 steel is going to be, you know, in general, it's going to be between 150 and 250 Vickers, depending on essentially how it's been formulated and how it's been heat treated. Uh, this actually turned out to be more like 450, which would put it roughly, at least on its surface, closer to something like Zinn's U-boat steel. So there is a difference. When they say it's over 1,000 Vickers, that's not true because it's, it's a relatively thin coating, but it does achieve something between 400 and 500 Vickers on the surface, which makes a meaningful difference if you're worried about scratches, scuffs, mm -hmm. especially the kind that come rubbing against the cuff or on the desk mm -hmm. at work. Now on the reverse side, you can see one of the interesting features of the Supermarine series. Back in the 1930s, the way to set a world speed record in an airplane was generally in some kind of a seaplane. And I believe this is the image of the S6B, a record setter that was both a seaplane built for performance and, in many respects, a design predecessor of the later Supermarine Spitfire that fought in World War II. So if you're wondering where the Supermarine name comes, it is derived from the company that was once known for building aquatic aircraft. And of course, Bremont is an aviation-driven name. Let's do a quick bezel sound off, because this one's also pretty good. It's very sharp. It's got 120 clicks, which means the gradient is a little bit finer. You get more individual snaps when setting this bezel. And if you're wondering, yes, the bezel insert is ceramic. That's a really nice piece. Yeah, I mean, if I, I would say if I had any cr critique whatsoever, for me, based on what I like to wear, I wish it was a teeny bit thinner. And it had a sapphire back. Yeah, I mean, that's always going to be a debate. Do you want to see a Salida or ETA basic movement? Um, it, I you mean, know, I get, you know, but again, I think, are, so are, do, you, do you think that they are um, finishing the, the ETA or Salida based movement or, or they're just putting it in as is? What I think, because it's a chronometer certified version, there are four different levels. There's base, there's elaboré, there's top, which is a chronometer in all but name, and then there's chronometer, which gets all the best parts plus the five position adjustment and the COSC test. Chronometer also means the highest standard of visual finish. Now, it's going to be mechanical finish, but it is going to be meaningfully better than the other grades. And because that's the awesome. standard they're using, if you were to open it up, it would be a machine finished movement, but a very good looking one, mm -hmm. being the chronometer grade. And of course, they also retest these as fully cased up watches in London where they do their work. So at the end of the day, you're getting a very accomplished movement that's probably about as unbustable as anything short of quartz. Yeah. And it's pretty good looking as now those things go. The watch is beautiful. Okay. Uh, the, and I will also say this. Brian would like a display case back, but he would also like it to be thinner, and you usually can't have both. In my experience, a display case back versus a watch that's identical without one, display case back adds about half a millimeter to mm -hmm. one millimeter. But again, that's a trade-off that most people would decide on their own. Uh, they appear to have made the decision that they're not going to show an ETA caliber. Okay. But on the other hand, the nice thing about the Debatoon DB28 Grand Sailor is that the movement is on the dial side. Now, this is a watch that came out in 2015 as the Lauberson watchmaker's first sports watch. Screw down crown, bullhead style, 100 meters water resistant, and surprisingly thin at under 13 millimeters thick. It features the signature spring loaded floating lugs of the DB28 series. Remember, the original DB28, mechanically identical and with the floating lugs, won the GPHG Egido back in 2011. Now, the watch has two barrels, it has triple shock protection, so you've got Inca block for the balance staff, but then you have two flanking fired blue and black polished springs. They call this triple parachute, and it makes this an incredibly shock-tolerant watch. The watch has a 
6-day manual wind power reserve. It has a deeply sloped chapter ring or reho internally. You'll also note that it uses de Batun's signature microlite engraving on the delta-shaped barrel bridge. There is a black polished mirror under the balance. Both the balance and the hairspring are their proprietary patents. There are probably six or seven patents that are exclusive to the company tied up in this watch, and it is the only example of the blue Grand Sailor I've ever seen, as the standard version of this watch was called the Grand Sport. And again, I cannot find another photo of a Grand Sailor in blue other than the one we are offering. It's 44 millimeters in titanium, but it's flat flush and it wears a dream because it's thin and it's light. I mean, it fits you incredibly well. Yeah, this is an awesome watch from a brand that I will unabashedly support in every way, declaring it my favorite brand overall, my favorite independent, and the watch into which I would be most likely to put my money if I were to start expanding my collection again. I would probably go for the digital version because I would like a jump hour and I don't need as much water resistance, but if you want an all-around watch from a company that only makes 150 watches a year, all of them by hand, this is gonna be your choice, and this is a fantastic, way to start a conversation with folks who aren't into watches or strike up a lifelong friendship with those who are. What do you think of Debatoon overall, Brian? Because I know we've had probably more of them in inventory than any other company in the world. I know we've probably had more of them than their authorized dealers, and they're intriguing pieces. Yeah, I mean, again, as far as the, you know, the designs are as forward-thinking as one can get. Denis Flagelet is one of the best living watchmakers. He came up with F.P. Journe. So he's producing incredible timepieces. They're low production, a few hundred units per year. You know, again, extremely recognizable from a distance. The ingenious lug system here allows the watch to be worn on a smaller or big wrist. You know, they continue to innovate these lines by adding watches like this. Again, the first, you know, call it uh, dive-worthy deep within watch that you can bring in the water. You know, I've, I've always been a fan of the design. For me, the level of watchmaking that goes into it, it's, you know, you want to you want to compare it to a, a Richard Mill in terms of the, the, the design or aesthetic. And the boldness, certainly. The, exactly. And I think that, but with this, you get watchmaking at the highest possible level. And, you know, that's one of the characteristics that goes unnoticed from a brand like this where it's bold, it's forward thinking, the design is crazy and awesome, but it's also truly incredible watchmaking. I'll also say this, if you were to create an equilateral triangle involving Richard Mille, MBNF, and Grubel Forsey, De Batoon would be the dot right in the center of that triangle. I should also mention there is a dial side power reserve over one of the barrels, and the dial has extraordinary depth. The finish you're getting is best in the business, and the nice thing is even if you have a partial feeling or predilection for another independent, there's room for both an FP Journe and a De Batoon in your collection, as this 100 meter watch gives you an option that you, you won't find in the Journe collection, and an aesthetic that likewise is unique to the brand. So you can have both, and I think collecting a broad range of independents is one of the coolest collection themes of the modern era. And you know, one of the other awesome characteristics of the brand is most brands that are producing, let's call it 50 to 150 or 50 to 200 watches per year, are producing anywhere from one to three references. They do them incredibly well. They make you know 50 of a watch. They're known for that watch. And that's what they do. A brand like Debethune, similar to FP Journe, but a lot less watches, he's making so many different models. You know, he's got this, he's got the Starry Various, he's got the Digital, and the list goes on. So for a brand that's producing only 200 watches per year, the fact that they've made and produce so many different calibers and so many different watches shows you what a mad scientist Denis Flagelet is. It's true. No company short of Swatch as a group is spending more money relative to its side on pure science, R&D, and original patents. So you're getting a lot when you buy one of these watches. You're getting all of that investment. And frankly, I think the only real criticism you can make of them is that they often put technology and product before business sense. And from a customer standpoint, I can't think of a better way for a watch brand to be flawed. Mm -hmm. No, and you know, and again, and the, the other is simply if you just don't like the aesthetic. But you know, again, you you know, not everybody can like a watch, so 
All right, Brian, yeah. parting thoughts. If people want to reach out to find any of these or get in contact with you, what do they do? So they can find me on Instagram at, you know, at Brian Goffberger. They can email me at brian at goffbergwatches.com and they can also email you. That's correct. Team also at thewatchbox.com. Buy, sell, or trade. Guys, thank you so much. Time out, Tim out, Brian out, and thanks for logging on.